So welcome to this edition of Getting to Know. This is a series of interviews with ringers from around the Essex Association, finding out a little bit about who they are, what they do, what their ringing history is, and what they do outside of ringing. Today, we're getting to know David Sparling. David, hello. Hello. Hi, how are you doing? I'm well, thank you. Good, good, good. Thank you very much for joining me today. Um, we'll take a little delve into the life of David Sparling. <laughs> Oh, well. David, you were a past master of the Essex Association. Um, you've probably held numerous other positions within Essex and elsewhere besides. You are now a life vice president of the Essex Association. Um, tell us a little bit about you and, and what you've done and what you're doing currently for Essex. So I learned to ring a long time ago. Um, when I was 10, and there's a story there which we might come back to, um, learnt at uh, Kirby Lisoken, uh, up in the northeast corner of Essex, which is almost closer to Suffolk than it is Essex in many ways. Um, and I learnt with my 10 year old twin brother, um, well, we might as well do the story now. Um, how did I get into it? Uh, the tower captain at the time uh, put a notice in the parish magazine saying that they were sure to bring us and my mum said oh I've got twin boys um, they'll learn to ring and that was pretty much it uh, so John and I learned to ring at the same time I was taught by a guy called Urban Wildney who was quite a prolific pill ringer around those time uh, John was taught by a guy called Bert Smith who was not a prolific ringer but an absolute gentleman uh, had been church warden for 27 years at Kirby, had rung there oh, for years and years and years. Um, and between them, um, we used to learn probably about half hour before the main practice. Bert used to pick us up, or Mr. Smith, as we called him in those days. Mr. Smith used to pick us up uh, and he used to set us homework. I do remember that. Um, so that was that was something which talking to other people who learnt at that time was quite unusual but he would set us little tasks of call changes um writing out plain hunt uh, writing out plain bob uh, and all those kind of things and and we used to meet him the following week and he would take our homework and he would mark it and take us through it and uh, and actually it it's you know it's something which we're coming back to now in terms of of teaching that there is a great deal of theory that needs to be learned. You need to do that outside of the tower. Uh, don't waste your valuable practice night doing that. So take it home and do it at home. My ringing sort of separates into three distinct phases. There was um, Kirby when I learnt uh, pre-university. And then I got to the great age of 17 and I went off to London for three years to study and I joined the University of London Society of Change Ringers um, and that was another very clear period of my life uh, and then there was post-university when I came back uh, and having spent a lot of time in London ringing on higher numbers so I got to ring at most of the famous London churches on 12 I got a bit of a taste for 12 bell ringing um, and Kirby only being an eight bell tower didn't really lend itself to that too well. So I used to go along to the band at St Mary Le Tower in Ipswich where I came under the wing of one George Pipe uh, who then um, taught me most of my 12 bell ringing. When you returned to Essex, um you started to get involved in the Essex Association a little bit more. Do you started taking on sort of some of the, the management type activities as well? Yes. Uh, well, that, that's kind of a, an interesting. I guess my background's quite different to many of the other people that have held association office. I didn't hold district office. Uh, there were always people around, um, uh, you know, great names like uh, Frank Lufkin, and uh, Bernard Fairhead was around, Neil Avis, um, Chris Lamb, um, Paul Bray, John Molster. So there were always a, 
a stream of people that held district office. Um, and my first office that I held in the association ever was master. So, so I went from, I went from uh, nothing to um, uh, sitting at the top table and chairing committee meetings in one fell swoop. And, and that really came about because in those days, we used to, at the AGM, we used to put on lunch. Um, and for years and years and years, lunch used to be ham, cheese and salad. Um, but at that time, Kirby had started to do a number of parish lunches and the ringers had helped with some of those parish lunches. So when it was the North East District's turn to do parish lunches, um, we decided that we would do a hot lunch. And I, if I remember right, we did pork chops and mashed potatoes and peas, which we served to probably nearly 100 people uh, in the old church buildings. And, um, and it went down really well. We didn't kill anyone. Uh, and they seemed to enjoy it. But at the end of that, it was the meeting at which Paul Camiard, my predecessor, announced that he would not be standing the following year. And I remember being in the kitchen with my pinny on, washing up, and two separate people came up to me and said, what do you think about standing as master? And I, I bear in mind, as I say, I'd never held district office at all. I was pretty much an unknown. Um, but two separate people in the space of that half hour came up and said you should do it. Um, and, and I guess actually there's, there's a, a lesson there which I think is valid today. We look for people to do things and we often beno bemoan the fact that no one comes forward. Um, my view is no one comes forward because they've received an email or because you put something on the website. Most people step into that role because someone has buttonholed them and they have stood in front of them and they've given them a direct challenge um, and importantly, um, offered their support and encouragement. So one of those people, you know, really knew what they were talking about. One of them was Lufkin, uh, Frank Lufkin, who'd held the job before. Um, and, you know, uh, A, I think you can do it, B, you know, blah, 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 I'll be there, we'll, we'll support you. So I think there is a real lesson there that if you want someone to do something, you have to, you have to find them and you have to go after them and the personal touch. Uh, and those of you who remember Frank will know that, you know, Frank didn't take no for an answer very easily. I went along to the February committee meeting as an observer, sat in the back row, watched what's going on. I'd never been to a committee meeting before. And the next one in October, I was chairing. So how did you find that going from having not perhaps had any experience at all of um, even at district level, the sort of management uh, machinery that goes on behind the, the association to suddenly finding yourself right at the front having to um, kind of find your way through a, a management committee agenda and uh, all the troubles and tribulations that go with that? Do you know, I really enjoyed it. Um, and I think it's probably that, uh, that puppy dog naivety. Um, how the rest of the committee took to it is a completely different story. But I really enjoyed it. And the thing that I found is that, of course, you came into it with no preconceived ideas. So, so one little story on that. I asked someone to deliver a report at the next committee meeting. So there was a report to be delivered and I went off and got someone. And I happened to be talking to somebody uh, about this report that had to be given. And, uh, uh, and I said, oh yeah, well, I think I'll get so-and-so to do that. So they won't do that. They won't do that. They've been on this committee for years and years and years. And they never do that. They won't do it. I said, well, I've just asked them. And they said, yes. <laughs> so there, there's this, it's a bit like unringable towers. 
they become a self-fulfilling prophecy if you're not careful that um, someone asked many years ago and they were refused and now you know that's an unavailable tower they've had three different incumbents and goodness knows how many new church wardens but that's cast in stone and i think that's also true so for me coming in i had no preconceived ideas i didn't know how anyone had done it before um, I did it the best I could. And incidentally, I had a brand new secretary as well. Mike Bishop was elected secretary at the same time. Um, and he was not quite so new to the committee, but we were certainly new as a team. Um, and again, you know, that has its downfalls because you don't have the same continuity. But equally, Mike and I found our way of working. That worked for us. It wasn't tainted by any previous incumbents view on how we should do it um i think we well i certainly enjoyed working with mike for the years that i did it and and you know as master it was uh, i loved it i absolutely loved the job i stepped down 1998 because i had some things going on at work and then we had this small matter of the millennium coming up and it was either a case of doing uh, of getting out now or having to do at least two more years because you didn't want to have to change master in the middle of the millennium year with so many things going on. So I, I'd step down otherwise, I, you know, I absolutely loved the job. Absolutely loved it. What is it you enjoy most about ringing generally? I think it comes down to that combination of physical coordination and mental effort and I'm a bit lazy on the mental effort side because I've always had quite a, a demanding job so there was only so much mental horsepower that I wanted to apply to um, method learning and stuff like that although you know I've done a fair bit of that over the time but it is bringing those two things together where you have the mental effort and the physical coordination and then it all comes together and the fact that it only comes together if everybody comes together. You know, you don't have um, you, you don't have a, a, a winning goal or a, a super try at rugby in the ringing fraternity. You know, everybody has to be on song. So it is absolutely that team effort. So when it does go well, you know, you have that. You have that collective euphoria where you sit in the pub afterwards and you bask in what you've done and you really enjoy it. And I've been on ringing holidays over the year, uh, over the years where we've had groups of people where, you know, without blowing our own trumpet too much, we had a pretty good band, certainly in the 80s, 90s, when we were much younger than we are now. Um, and we would go off and you'd spend a week having some really stonkingly good ringing and then you'd have the evening together where you just sort of basked in that and it was really interesting that as some of the makeup of the group changed over the years and sometimes the ringing wasn't quite so good the social side suffered as well you didn't have that kind of buzz at the end of the day uh, where you where you'd done it and you know little things i remember this story we were down in the west country and I forget the exact tower, but we were met by the local who took one look at us. You know, we were in our 20s. We weren't particularly well-dressed. We were probably a bit scruffy. Um, and he turned up and, you know, kind of summed us up fairly quickly, let us in fairly, you know, he wasn't unpleasant, but he wasn't super friendly. Anyway, we rang a quarter and, and, and from memory, and it was, I forget what it was, but it was pretty good ringing. At the end, he came and met us. He, he'd had a complete personality tra transplant. You know, suddenly he recognised that, well, we might be a bit scruffy, but we did know what we were doing. We rang the bells up in Peel. We, we rang the quarter. We rang them down in Peel. And he, he just greeted us. He gave us a tour of the church. He gave us a little history lesson on the church. He was completely different. So that that being able to sort of create that impression when it all comes good, because you have the times where it doesn't quite go so well, but uh, um, that one was that one was one that sticks in the brain. What would you suggest then might be your greatest 
ringing memory or your your greatest achievement so far? Uh, I I enjoyed my time as master. We didn't have too many arguments and have too many complaints, so perhaps that was okay. Um, you know, you remember certain peels that you rang in. Um, I remember a certain peel we rang at Clare um, for a pretty short sure Stephen Petman's wedding and we rang Bristol for his wedding and it was one of the best pills I've rung. I know I only rang the treble. I know the next morning I couldn't open any of my fingers. I had gripped that rope so hard so as to not drop the backstroke on George Pipe who was ringing the tenor that the next morning I couldn't open my fingers. Um, I remember that. Um, perhaps one of the ones that I'm really, I know proud is the word, but, but really pleased to have got we rang a peel with a Kirby Sunday service band in January 2000 uh, for the new millennium. It was my first on eight as conductor. I'm no conductor at all. I only do it under sufferance. Um, so my first as conductor, we had a first peeler. We had a first person that had run the first peel for 25 years. Um, two or three other people were not regular peel ringers. They might have rung one or two, um, but it really was um, an inexperienced peel band. And we rang a cracking quarter. It was plain Bob triples, um, you know, nothing, nothing spectacular. But I tell you what, it was, it, it was a good one. And and you know, I say I conducted it. I didn't conduct it. I put the bobs in uh, and a few singles. And fortunately. No one went wrong. We just, we rang this and really, really, really pleased to have got that with a local band. And I guess that comes down to the, you know, being a team effort rather than, a, oh, my personal favourite. Uh, we rang, we rang 12,240 changes of 41 splice surprise minor, all the work. So they're the 41 regular surprise minor methods. And it was the first band, we believe, anywhere to have rung all of them, all the work. And the 12,240 was the shortest peel we could. So that's two peels and a quarter, end over end. Uh, I think it was six hours, 58 minutes, something like that. Um, but again, that being the culmination of a lot of team practice. We just got a group of six and we just stuck at it and, and did it. There are so many memories. I've been really, really lucky. What experience have you had of when something's gone completely the other way and it's all gone wrong? Oh, there's lots. <laughs> oh, there's lots. Um, I remember I wanted to ring a peel of Stedman triples. I've not rung Stedman triples. Um, so I got my University of London mates to come down or up to uh, North East Essex for a weekend. And um, we went for a peel of Stedman triples at Great Holland. Now bear in mind, you know, these were superstar ringers. Um, they had rung um, 23 spliced, all the work, uh, surprise major, not me. I used to ring the treble for them, but they had, I mean, they were really seriously good ringers. Anyway, we set off for this peel of Stedman triples and I think we'd rung a little over an hour and it came into rounds clean as a whistle beautiful it'd been immaculate ringing there hadn't been a trip in it it was just wonderful came into rounds uh, at hand stroke i think anyway we went back to my mum's uh, where i was living at the time and mum made us cups of tea and we sat around and i swear we spent longer analyzing what had gone wrong than we did not ringing it we could, have run, we could have gone back to Great Holland and done it all again in the time we spent. The conductor was adamant that he hadn't miscalled it. Everyone else was adamant they hadn't swapped over. Um, so that was, that was an embarrassment. Uh, my greatest embarrassment would be um, the peel that I went to ring at Nacton in Suffolk. And this was long before the days of SatNav and long before the days of mobile phone. But I turned up in good time, parked near the church, wandered around, slightly surprised to see no one else was there yet, but you know, that's okay, nice sunny day. Had a look around, church was locked, couldn't get in. Um, just hung around, still no one came. Got very close to the time when we were meant to be meeting and still no one there. 
walked up the road a little bit, found a, a gentleman in his garden who was gardening away, and I said, um, do you, um, do you hear the bells here? He said, oh, yeah, 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 hear them on Sunday. So I hung around there. Anyway, cut a long story short, I gave up, no one else came. And I went home uh, to find a message on my answer phone from the four other ringers that had gone to Acton in Suffolk, wondering where I was. Um, and, and that's got to be 30 something years ago. And I can tell you, every time I meet those people, they remind me of my non pill at Nacton. And the wonderful thing is that Nacton, for those who don't know, they don't have any bells. You've mentioned that you've uh, rung in London, you've rung with some, some really outstanding ringers throughout the years, you've rung uh, 12 bell pills and such, and the, the 41 all the work. Are there any bell ringing goals or ambitions left? Uh, for me, no, not really. I, I'm, I'm, I'm at that point where I enjoy doing what I do. Um, my brain is not as sharp as it was when I was in my 20s. It takes me a long time to learn anything new. I have really much in, in enjoyed the recent 10 bell ringing that we've been doing in Essex. Um, we rang Bristol, we rang London. Um, and and that, was, that was fun. In terms of ambitions, no, I, my ambition really is to enjoy it. And the thing I enjoy most of all is trying to encourage other people to enjoy it as much as I have. So uh, you said before, you know, I'm now involved uh, with ART and the Association of Ringing Teachers uh, to try and um, help teach ringing. Uh, and that's a bit that I really do enjoy. I don't, I don't know that I've got any great personal ambitions other than just carry on enjoying what I'm doing. So what might you say to other ringers about ringing in general? How would you enthuse them? How would you encourage them? My absolute advice would be to get out there and meet as many people as you can and be... Um, be prepared to, to ask for what you want. I think that's one of the big things when I learned, and I said all those years ago, it was very much you turned up and you were told what to do. Um, ringing now, I think, is much more collaborative. People have much more say in what it is that they get to do and would like to do. And, and the thing that I would say to all of those people is, you will always find somebody willing to help someone who is enthusiastic. We, everybody loves an enthusiast. We're all enthusiastic. We all do it because we love it. None of us get paid. None of us make a living out of it. Um, so if you have something that really sparks your interest, I guarantee you, that you will find someone who will help. And people are absolutely delighted to come along and help. You know, if someone wants to ring a quarter of a plain bob, or someone wants to learn Cambridge, or someone wants to learn something on 10, you will always be able to find a band. And if you don't know them yourself, you will know someone who will know someone who will get them. And, and actually in Essex, we are extremely fortunate that we have a core of people that all fit in that description. So how might you translate that and, and how would you describe to non-ringers and how would you um, perhaps encourage someone who doesn't know anything about ringing to consider taking it up? Number one, uh, forget the Mars advert. It's really not like that. Uh, and number two, it is absolutely open. And I think one of the things that's changed, again, since all those years ago when I learned, is that we do have the social media, we have internet, we have um, websites, uh, and it is so much easier um, to find a place to go and learn if you want to. It is a wonderful world. There is so much more to it. Like so many things, there's so much more to it than looks from the outside, and a lot more than is depicted in the Mars advert. What unexpected things do you think ringing has taught you? I can't really think of anything unexpected. 
um, because they didn't know what to expect all those years ago anyway. I guess the, the one unexpected is that I can reel off factorials all the way up to eight without even thinking about it. But uh, I'm not sure really how useful that is. Um, you know, what, what you do learn is that um, you can't tell at the outset who's going to be good and who's not. There are, there are some supremely clever people that have really struggled at ringing. And there are some people that, you know, actually may well have struggled academically, but actually take to ringing like a duck to water. And, and it's a fabulous leveler, a fabulous leveler. It can also be, you know, difficult for some of those people, um, you know, they may well be absolute experts in their own profession. And then you put them on the end of the rope and instantly, you know, they are right at the beginning of a very long um, and, and sometimes slippery learning curve. So it, it is a great leveller, and um, I think that's probably one of the great fascinations of it. We've mentioned a couple of times um, ART, the Association of Ringing Teachers. Um, you are now involved in that sort of quite heavily. What made you decide to become involved in ART, and, and what is your role within ART? So the easy part of that is the role. So I am now a trustee and a member of the management committee. And I am one of the art tutors whereby I run teaching courses to teach people how to teach people to ring. So it is not direct teaching, which I do on my own back anyway. So I, I you know, I'm, help with a local school here to teach people to ring but within art I am teaching people how to teach people um, and how did I get involved well pretty much the same way I got involved with the Essex Association as master someone tapped me on the shoulder and asked me if I would um, if I would like to get involved uh, and teaching is something I've always enjoyed. I've been a tutor on the Essex course ever since it was founded. Um, and, and I really, you know, I love ringing and, and, and much like Frank Lufkin, who was so instrumental in my early days, you know, you, you want, you want to just impart a little bit of that enthusiasm and love for it into other people. I go back to when I was taught, I was a very slow learner, a very slow learner. Um, I was only 10, I was little, uh, and it took me a long while to get to grips with it. You know, there were times when you think, no, I'm not sure this is for me. Um, and if you look at what's happened to teaching in other areas, both my children learn piano. They have a very structured method of learning the piano. You know, there are, there, there are registered teachers who you know have certain qualifications, or if not qualifications, at least experience. There is a really clearly defined curriculum as to what you're going to follow as you go up through the grades. But ringing for 360 years has been taught by whoever happens to be around, often somebody who got press ganged into the job, done as a side event at a practice night. And there is, there has to be a better way of doing it. And there is a better way of doing it. And what art has developed over the years uh, is that very clear structured approach to doing it. It's not the only one and uh, it's not perfect, but for, um, but for providing a framework of how to approach it uh, built up you know, by people who, um, are professional teachers and I find the learning process fascinating uh, and and you know I am still an enthusiast after all these years and I'm really really keen to help anyone else who has that interest to be able to develop that and and um, and make the best progress they can. What else happens in David Sparling's life outside of ringing? So, as well as my roles with Art and EACR, I'm also Chairman and Treasurer of the Friends of St Michael's at Kirby, 
um, which is where I grew up. And my brother and sister were married. My parents were married. My parents are buried. My grandparents are buried. So I've been involved in that for the last, oh, I don't know, 15, 20 years, perhaps. Um, and we've successfully brought to conclusion with the PCC a couple of projects totaling £250,000 or so to uh, shore up first the south end of the church and uh, the east end. So that has been um, a reasonably time consuming piece of work. I've got two teenage children. Um, so I'm a, a full time unpaid taxi driver. Um, and aside from that, you know, when I'm not falling off, I quite enjoy cycling. Um, we, I, I love the theatre and cinema and walking. We lead a pretty busy life. But again, going back to my great mate, Frank Lupkin, he always said, if you want something done, ask a busy person. So how do you juggle your ringing activities with your commitments of everyday life and your art commitments and everything else that's going on? Well, it's relatively easy now because I'm retired. I am of that great age. Um, so uh, I, I do have the time to do it. And, and it really is lovely to be able to do that. In my working life, it was much more difficult. Um, I used to be last minute dot com ringer. So if someone was short for a quarter or a wedding or a peel, uh, on Saturday and they fell short on the Thursday um, I was the person that they would ask because I knew on Thursday what I would be doing on Saturday if someone asked me if I would ring in a quarter or a peel in two months time I would have to say I have no idea because I don't know where I'll be for work I used to do a lot of travel so that was incredibly disruptive now it's it's easy um, that's lovely. So I have the time to do just what I want. So to finish up then, David, is there anything else? Uh, have you got any other stories or anything else that you'd like to share with us? During my university time, um, I met a gentleman called Roger Bailey, who some of you will know. Roger was a genius, a maverick, um, an anarchist, all rolled into one. Um, but he was a brilliant handbell ringer and a brilliant handbell tutor. And, and he taught me while I was at Imperial to ring handbells. In fact, he taught myself and a guy called David James, great, still a great friend of mine. Neither of us had run handbells before. And we used to make in Roger's um, office every lunchtime. So Roger was, as well as a ringer with the University of London, he was a senior lecturer at Imperial College on computer science. Um, the stories of why he joined Imperial um, is something to do with they've got one of the best computers in London that he could write his peel proofing programs on in his spare time. But he taught myself and David James from scratch to ring handbells. And we went from nothing um, to a peel of seven methods within a year, just meeting half an hour every lunchtime. But one of the things that... Um, you're, when you're ringing handbells, sometimes you get your hands muddled up and, and what you call you swap your pair over. And um, anyway, uh, this used to happen every so often. And they would say, David, you've got your pair over. Well, of course, there were two Davids, which didn't help. But um, cut a long story uh, short, many, many, many years. Bear in mind, I left university in 1980. Um, my son, James, was born in 2002. So quite a few years later, and we followed the tradition of James's middle name is his father's first name. So he is James David. And after his birth, I received a postcard from Roger Bailey, which simply said, um, James David, hey, I see he's swapped his pair over again. So 20, 20, whatever, no, what is it? Yeah, 20 something years after, no explanation. It just got a PS. Um, David, you might need to explain this to Jill. David, thank you very much for sharing your experiences and stories with us. It's been really interesting to, to gamble through some of what you've been up to. Um, we will be uh, looking at the next edition of Getting to Know very, very soon.
Excellent. Well, it's been a pleasure. Thank you very much.